Welcome tonight to the Judy Brooks Conversations. This was named after a wonderful member of our community, Judy Brooks, who was served on the select board, who served the League of Women Voters unbelievably well, and so many other things. And we felt that she would be honored and happy for us to name this after her because it represents her caring about this community and trying to make changes. I'm gonna introduce you to a professor and also the director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center. And since this is the month of Du Bois' birth, we at the Racial Justice Committee decided that we wanted to celebrate W.E.B. Du Bois. And who better than to talk to the director, Whitney Battle Baptiste. Um, and she is a professor uh, in the anthropolo anthropological department and the director of the Du Bois Center of UMass. She's a Bronx girl, like her mother, and from New York. And she's an activist scholar who seeks, uh, sees the classroom and campus as a space to engage contemporary issues with sensibility of the past. Her academic training is history and historical archaeology. Her research critically engages the interconnectedness of race, gender, class, and sexuality through an archaeological lens. Her research sites include Andrew Jackson's Hermitage uh, Plantation, the Abiel Smith School in, of Beacon Hill in Boston, the W.B. Du Bois home site or House of the Burkhart, the Black Burkharts in, in Great Barrington, Mass uh, Massachusetts, a community-based heritage site in Miller's Plantation. And her book is Black Feminist Archaeology, and I believe, and Du Bois' data portraits visualizing Black America, which she wrote with uh, compiled with Britt Russett. Um, but the second edition of Black Feminist Archaeology is coming out soon, so looking forward to that. With that, and with much pride and and uh, adulation, I introduce you to my daughter, Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. It's always weird on Zoom. We'd be like, yay. Um, and there's silence, but it's okay. So I'm going to do um, uh, informal type of, of talk because um, that's the type of talk that I do. And I will give um, some, I would love to give time at the end to engage and answer a couple of questions would be great. So um, I, I just want to focus on kind of three words or two words with an end, and that is um, data and democracy. I, um, what do they have to do with each other? Well, a lot. When I started to think about what I wanted to talk about in terms of Du Bois's birthday, as well as um, Black History Month or Black Heritage Month, however you refer to it, um, I thought a lot about the data in my life um, and the, some of the things that came to my mind, uh, TikTok, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, Pinterest, cell phones, census data, um, Amazon, toll booths, <laughs> spending habits, and I could go on and end and, and let's end with exit interviews, right? Especially from the polls. So as I was thinking about it, I also thought about this idea of monetizing data, right? So how does data become commodified? How does it become the thing that, um, why is it that the next time you open uh, something that has the potential to have an ad, there's something that you recently looked at, right? And how did they find out? Or the fact that Alexa hears everything. Oops. Okay, sorry. Um, hears everything and, and processes it and creates profiles based on what you do and how you do it. So that's what I wanted to kind of start with because that's what I want to end with, but I'm gonna do a lot in between. So what I wanna talk to you about is, is, is data, Du Bois style, um, sociology, Du Bois style. Um, Eldon Morris who wrote uh, The Scholar Denied um, credits uh, W.E.B. Du Bois as the kind of founder 
of um, American or, or uh, dem uh, social, social sociology in the United States. And the reasoning why is hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll understand why, and not just the Philadelphia Negro, which was published in 1899. So I wanna start off with the 1900 um, um, Paris Exposition, World Exposition that happened um, in Paris. And what happened there was through the, actually through the endorsement and assistance of none other than Booker T. Washington, um, there was a push by a man named uh, Thomas Calloway, who was a lawyer, an educator, and also the editor of um, the uh, Colored American, which was a black newspaper out of Washington, DC. He also went to fist with Du Bois. So they were, they knew each other and um, he reached out to Du Bois because of this endorsement by Booker T. Washington forced kind of the US government to include an exhibit dedicated entirely to um, African-Americans in the United States. Again, 1900, we're talking three decades, 30 years outside of slavery. Um, but part of the sell for this was, let's show the progress we have made, right? In terms of African-Americans and the kinds of thing, it was, it was very data-based graphs, charts, maps, tables. However, this exhibit was a little bit different and I'm gonna get into um, kind of how that was, uh, 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 was very, was not very, it was very different. Um, so Du Bois is uh, recently um, finishing up his um, Philadelphia Negro project. And the Philadelphia Negro project was actually started on August 1st, 1896 and ended on December 31st, 1897. It was uh, commissioned by UPenn. Um, and the truth is, is that Du Bois felt after all this amazing work, I think he was thinking he was going to get a tenure track position at this place called UPenn, um, but he didn't. And he said he never actually stepped foot in a classroom at UPenn. Um, so again, I want to, to do a little sidebar here, although I know, you know, we may, we often make claims that uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African-American to receive his PhD from Harvard. I do want to um, um, bring up the fact that when he went to Harvard, he had already gone to Fisk for a bachelor's and Harvard did not accept his historically black university um, degree. So he had to then get his bachelor's again his master's and then his PhD. Um, and so Du Bois often and free, well, frequently all the time said he went to Harvard. He was not of Harvard. So I say that because it's very, not just because I'm at UMass Amherst, which is the flagship school of the state of Massachusetts, um, but it's also thinking about the ways in which, even though he's doing studies commissioned by Ivy League institutions, um, graduating from Ivy League institutions, he is still completely shut out of mainstream academia. So he um, initially goes to Wilberforce um, in Ohio, another hist uh, a historically black college. Um, it didn't it didn't last uh, good. Uh, it, he didn't stay. Um, he felt there was a lot of uh, too much religious leaning. He was not able to teach sociology, and that was the main thing that he wanted to teach. And so, but the good thing about Wilberforce is he did meet his wife. So, you know, that there were some benefits. So he moves his young wife as newlyweds to um, Philadelphia, Seventh Ward, to um, do this study. Um, and this study was really specific, right? It was looking at 40,000 African-Americans living in this this area called the Seventh Ward. And for him, it was very important to really point out like I, I terms such as um, 
actually a different scholar said this, but and and didn't write the name down. So sorry. Um, this idea of material powerlessness, this idea that African Americans in many ways were many ways were bound to specific geographical areas where there was limited employment, limited uh, other types of resources and think about walking into a store and not being able to purchase things because of racial discrimination, et cetera, regardless of it being a urban space, right? Um, and so some of, the, um, some of the issues that came up or some of initial questions, because this was a door, a, a house to house survey. I want to, um, Again, there's a, we have another sidebar. I want you to imagine W.E.B. Du Bois pretty recently coming back from Germany, graduating from Harvard, getting a, a job at, at, at Wilberforce. But Du Bois is a cert, has a certain kind of stature. I don't mean he was tall because he was short. However, he wore a bow tie. He um, picked up a, a, apparently a cane in Germany, as well as his uh, distinctive mustache and goatee that he brought back, um, his style, his style. And I, and I heard often in Atlanta when he walked, not only did he have a top hat or a hat on, he also uh, wore gloves. So I just want to, to create that image and now think about him knocking on door house to house, asking you questions like this. How many members of your family live in this house? Um, what is your age and sex? Um, what is the conjugal conditioning? Uh, what is the conjugal conditions of the folks in this house? Are you married? Are you single? Are you not married? Are these children yours? Um, what is your birthplace? What is your ability to read and write? What is your occupation and your earnings? Have you had formal education? How long have you been in Philadelphia? But again, I want you to, to think about the, kind, the, the person knocking at your door. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a little bit of, of Du Bois's words, and then I'm gonna share a little bit of, um, uh, I would say intrigue and, 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 and whatever, um, the words of Sadia Hartman, who kind of writes a literary historically based fiction-ish fiction -ish novel about what she thought kind of Du Bois presented to the folks of the Seventh Ward and the fact that it was probably a little difficult for them to accept um, Dr. Du Bois knocking on their door asking um, these kinds of questions. So do, remember, data, data, data. So Du Bois is saying, um, and this is on the section in the introduction where he, he maps out his methodology and this it's a shame that he has to include, but he does. And this section is called the credibility of the results. Convictions on all great matters of human interest, one must have to a greater or less degree, and they will enter to some extent into the most cold-blooded scientific research as a distributing factor. Nevertheless, here are social problems before us demanding careful study questions awaiting satisfactory answers. We must study, we must investigate, we must attempt to solve. And the utmost that the world can demand is not lack of human interest and moral conviction, but rather the heart quality of fairness and an earnest desire for the truth, despite its possible unpleasantness. I also want to remind you Du Bois was young. And although everybody thinks Du Bois was super radical, um, Du Bois uh, in 1900 was, was pretty conservative, actually. Um, and the older he got, unlike, well, maybe some of us, um, uh, the older we get, the more radical we become. And I think that was kind of his trajectory. So I'm going to read. It's a little lengthy, but I swear it's juicy. So, you know, um, I just want to read this. This is from Sadia Hartman's Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval. So she's talking about Du Bois, um, who again, remember his wife, uh, Nina, newlyweds, she's basically locked 
in the apartment because she doesn't want to go outside because this is not a neighborhood that she would choose to live in, number one. And Du Bois is gone most of the day, all of the day, coming home for dinner, then going back out. Um, so he would, it, it, he, she kind of maps out his day. After dinner, he returned to work. His books and notes covered the dining table. He pored over histories of Philadelphia, reviewed three centuries of state law consulted surveys of London and New York and Chicago and compiled statistics about birth rates, age of marriage, births out of wedlock, crime, divorce, and death. He charted graphs and plotted statistical tables, consulted Charles Booth's nine volume study, Life and Labor of the People of London. The hand colored maps reflected the expansion and density of the black quarter, made visible the different classes that constituted the race and documented the segregation of the Negro from the rest of the city. He translated the stories of the ward into statistics and graphs, muting the voices and ag aggregating the lives of those interviewed into a grand sociological pattern, rendering the dire conditions of everyday existence into numerical tables. Society was the regularities of human action. The figures, charts, and graphs aspired to be a moving picture of Black life that documented the Negro's modernity and made clear that the race had a future. A moving picture was a living image, a story in motion. The Negro was not fixed, but changing and, variab and variable entity a changing and variable entity. The diagrams try to render the great vicissitudes of black life and represent historical development over the course of a century. While the best minds at the University of Chicago and Columbia might want to believe that black folks were dying out and would one day be extinct, he intended to prove otherwise. The graphic pictures contested Hoffman's statistics about the increasing rates of morta uh, mortality among urban Negroes and projections regarding their eventual disappearance. I said disappearance. Contrary to photographs, which arrested motion and fixed time, making the contingent and unfolding present into the eternal, his charts and graphs represented change over time. They detailed the advances and regresses, the stops and starts of history, offering a visual account of black movement, rush, strike, and swarm. Diagrams captured the primary and secondary rhythms of black life. The visual lexicon anticipated the cinema, formed its prehistory, recording the movement of the Negro from small towns to the city and a steady movement forward over the course of time. History wrote itself in figures and graphs, and uh, figures and graphs, and statistics transported, transposed lives into bars and curves, densities of ink and color. Tables contrasted the rates of black and white poverty, detailed the frequency of separation and widowhood, showed the incidence of disease, and differentiated the race into distinct classes. The colored maps charted the diffusion of re residence, morality, aspiration, and need. So that's beautiful prose. I just want to say that uh, Sadia Hartman um, is also a MacArthur genius, and, and that's why. Um, but what she also talks about is his not fitting in to the seventh ward and sticking out. And again, he's knocking on your door asking you these lovely questions that probably today you would not answer if someone asked them without saying, you're Dr. Who? Uh, okay. Um, and so the Philadelphia Negro is kind of Du Bois's entry into the world of sociology in print form. And the book is large. It is very, very large. And this is also the reason why his friend Thomas Calloway came to him because of the data. You have the data, you have the data. But between the, the moving from Philadelphia when he did not get a position at UPenn, he then relocates to Atlanta, where he spent 
off and on 23 years teaching at what is now Clark Atlanta University, which is also a historically black college. I said combined because just like the NAACP, Du Bois was good at getting um, fired, but rehired you know, soon after, but he was really good at getting fired. Um, so Thomas Callaway comes to him with this, like, I've got this. And this is, you know, before Souls of Black Folks, so he hasn't really written about Booker T. Washington. Uh, yeah, so, and, and that happens later on. But this, he goes to, to Atlanta, uh, Atlanta University at that time. And he's trying to create an exhibit that is going to reflect progress since 1865. Very important for him. He is tapping into the resources of Tuskegee Institute, Howard University, Hampton Institute, and several other HBCUs in that kind of um, from Virginia down on through and then West um, and other industrial schools that were um, teaching um, black students um, at, that, at this moment, 19, 1899. So why, and why does the 1900 ex exhibition not read like the Philadelphia Negro? It doesn't read like the Philadelphia Negro because life happened to Du Bois and death happened to Du Bois. And it changed the way he did his research. It changed the way he saw his purpose. Um, so in 1899, um, in April of 1899, there was a really, um, I say in April, in April, he had two major things that shifted him. One was the lynching of a man named Sam Hose right outside of Atlanta, Georgia in about on about, well, not on about, on April 22nd, 1899. A month after that, on um, May 24th, 1899, he lost his first child. Um, he lost his first child to diphtheria. If he had gotten treatment, he would have lived, but he was colored. Therefore, this is Du Bois, this is the catalyst also, the 1900 exhibit is the catalyst for the souls of black folk. The line, the, the problem with the 20th century is the color line was first written in the exhibit of the 1900 Paris Exposition. That's the first time it appears. Souls of Black Folk has a, cha has a chapter written called The Passing of the Firstborn. Um, it also has Booker T. Washington and, and some other folks in there. But what, what I'm saying about this is that this was a moment that it was undeniable. He could see that the statistics, that the door-to-door -door surveys, that the graphs, the charts, the maps were not enough. Um, he said, one of the things that he talked about was, and I will quote him to saying, the ultimate evil is stupidity. That's, that's a Du Bois quote. And for him, he said that because he felt that the whites of this country are completely ignorant when it comes to black life. And he said that he realized, quote unquote, that he could not be a calm, cool, and detached scientist while Negroes were lynched, murdered, and starved. He knew, for him, the crisis of American democracy was race prejudice, and race prejudice was threatening it at its core. He wanted to show how, through the art and the work of propaganda, and I will explain why I use that word, that he was then reborn as a public intellectual. Um, and I say propaganda because if you, if you look at the exhibit itself, the exhibit takes up a, a, a large space, first of all. Um, he spent so money on the materials that he had to ride like at the bottom of the boat to get to Paris because he ran out of money. Um, but he got there because Du Bois is a hands-on kind of person. So he had to be there for every step of everything. He's very um, much about control. Um, and this is great because I'm giving you lovely little um, tidbits about uh, Du Bois's personality. Um, if you look at archives, 
Um, they are better than any reality sh TV show you could ever watch. Archives are just so juicy. Um, so the exhibit itself showed pictures, right? It shows pictures of, of, of African-American students in classrooms, um, learning about the domestic arts, learning science, uh, teaching, um, 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 iron work in, in, in industrial things that are, you know, apprenticeships, all these kinds of things. And they're from all over HBCU. Um, um, HBCUs are contributing to these pictures. But also in his data, his data is showing home ownership and the rot from 1865 to 1900. And you can see that African Americans are actually owning property and not just in the South. Um, but but this was specifically about rural Georgia. So he is using um, he is using information from U.S. Census data, um, Atlanta University reports that are actually Atlanta University students going out, gathering this data and doing the research. Right. He's also the U.S. And, and some of this information not just made it to the 1900 exposition, but also made it into the U.S. Bureau um, of Labor and, and what would become labor and statistics. Um, and so I wanted to kind of, before I forget, also in the exhibit was sculpture and art, photography, yes, but also books shelves and shelves of books written by African-Americans. Um, all of this was about the contributions. And I want to emphasize the fact that he's doing this at an exhibition where at the same grounds, there are people who are highlighting human zoos. And there's, there's a, a lovely pause there because I want you to think about the juxtaposition of how, and, and please, I, want, I, I don't want us to, to, to think that the US government was out here trying to you know, be, oh, we're great, we're wonderful. Look, look what we do for, for, for our, our Negro population. What it really was, it was in some ways, this is the success of the United States. Look, look, look at our people just out of slavery. Look how well they're doing. Um, it, and again, I want you to understand like 1900, like Jim Crow is just, you know, getting its standing legs and, you know, he's starting to walk and he crawl and, and, and become completely dominant in the South and other parts of the U.S. So this exhibit is happening and it's completely out of character for the United States. And I would say it probably wouldn't happen again for a long time. The idea of democracy, the idea of data, then what does this information do for us? How does the information that is gathered about our, 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 our eating habits, our buying habits, um, the things that we, um, the political you know, uh, contributions we make, who, who we vote for, who we say we vote for, because sometimes those, those can be two different things. Um, and this in many ways to me, is about more than just about material, right? It's more than about the idea of access to wealth. And, and this is very problematic because as Du Bois gets older and he talks more specifically about the connection between capitalism and racism, which also eventually um, the radical Martin Luther King talks about, right? It's not just about um, racial equality, it's about social and economic equality. Because as soon as long as we are directly tied and woven into a system of capitalism, there is no way for equity, inclusion, belonging, and all of those things to actually be sustainable or real. I'm sorry, that was extremely negative. So, um, but together we can make a change. I'm um, sorry, I just had to do something to kind of lighten that up because that was a little, that was a little, I'm sounding like Du Bois now, he's very, um, but also he died at 95, so he saw a lot. Um, and by the time he was in Ghana, he was, he was talking a lot because also I want you to remember, he was put on trial at the age of 81 for being a agent of a foreign power because he was um, in charge of the peace information 
counsel. Somebody's going to correct me. It's fine. Um, but what that is about is about the fact that you're talking about a organization that was against nuclear weapons that were trying to find out ways. This is in 1954 when he was put on trial, 51, 54. This is why I left history, sorry. Um, and he um, literally was a part of a movement to stop the accumulation of nuclear weapons, 1950s, right? And so where are we now compared to that? But we're talking about someone who saw democracy as no longer being um, in the power of the people, right? But seeing it in the power of those with money. And for him, he still, no matter what, did not give up on the US, even though you know naysayers would say he did, but he didn't. What he tried to stress to people, especially African-Americans, is that you need to know what to do locally. You need to, because that's where the power of the people is. Who is on your school board? Who is on your um, committees? <laughs> That's terrible. Um, who, are, who, who, is, who is your senator? Who is your representative? Who is your mayor? Who is, so these are, I'm sorry, that's Amherst, there's no mayor. Um, who is, who, is um, who are the people that you can actually believe that you can affect change and you can communicate with? And if there is no one, then it's time for you to step up. Like this way, and Du Bois ran for Senate. Um, a lot of people don't know, but he did um, run for Senate. He didn't win. Um, and he was a third party candidate, of course. He, did, he was not Democrat or uh, Republican. Um, and I wanted to also emphasize before I start talking about the modern and close up is this idea was like this idea of a nation within a nation was something that was real until the push toward Brown v. Board of Education. And, and I would say that this is, that's a whole other talk because there was a movement and, and it was led at Howard University. And one of the people was E. Franklin Frazier that, that, that was really um, helping to establish this ideal that African-Americans were just as American as everybody else. So this idea, we had to kind of pull away from this idea of a nation within a nation. No, shh, we are but we are also US Americans. And I use the term US Americans only because Canada and Mexico technically, you know, and Central America and South America. So I like to say US American, it distinguishes the borders, um, even though they're not good borders. Okay, um, so this idea that we have to understand that we can thrive, right? Here is a man who was educated at Harvard, but made a change at a historically black college, a nation within a nation, right? Understanding that it is through that, that we begin to, and again, the talented 10th, the early years, a little, a, a, a little bit shady, I would say, because when I say shady, I mean, um, I mean in the sense that the ideal is to have 10% of the population be through education, lift up another 10% and so on and so on. Unfortunately, what happens to the 10% that makes it, they get a car with a driveway and a house and they wanna stay there and they're not going back to get another 10%. So something happens with that, and then because people would argue there is a middle class and there is a black middle class. And again, this idea of democracy being tied to data is very important at this moment. When we think about equality, when we think about this idea that if an African-American person owns a house, it sells for less. If an African-American goes into a car dealership, they're going to pay more money. It's called the black tax. And whether we don't wanna believe it or not, 
believe me, it's true as someone who suffers from that or the fact that in order to sell my house, I had to make everything either beige or white and have no pictures or nothing ethnic. That shows you that you have to create this ideal of what um, US American is. And again, it is not us, even though we are the global majority and it looks like we are going to be the national majority. I'm not talking about you know, African-Americans, I am talking about people of color, right? BIPOC, um, et cetera, et cetera. I am a little bit concerned about our how much how much and how influential data is in our lives. And I think that in many ways, the data that we are fed through those things that I mentioned, TikTok and, and Facebook, and, and we know the evils, right, of social media and how it can be very manipulative and manipulating, right? And so with that data, if there is a connection that you have with the local, you know what's real and what's not real. I feel that the fact that I look at the way in which con the, you know Congress is 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 moving and shaking right now, it's very scary. It's scary in the sense that there are certain we we have to make deals because of extremes, right? And and all of the the ways in which we we are being manipulated into thinking certain things because of the fear of the unknown, right? The fear that the data is helping to produce, the fear that the data keeps going. And I don't know, I swear, you know, I I I have no nothing against Tesla the car itself. But I'm just saying, I don't know, maybe there's something in the screens, make sure that this, you know, like that dude is not, you know, telling you anything as you're driving around in your Tesla. I don't know. But I just think that it's very interesting. An example is data shows that people want to move to non, we want to move away from oil. We want to move away from gas. So why is it that it is very hard, difficult, and expensive to transition from gas to electric completely. And you're trying to buy a car. If you want to do it well, you do it so the people can get it, right? And, and this idea of, well, it's too expensive, it's out of reach. Well, climate change is not out of reach. Climate change is here. So unless we dedicate ourselves and understand we have to figure out a way to shift and to understand that the opinions and the needs of the people is what a democracy should have. And that propaganda word I used earlier is very important because I think that Du Bois used propaganda in a way to alert African-Americans that some of us see what's going on. You understand this. Let's try to figure out a way to translate this so that nationally we can make a difference. And one of the things that I think was seen as empowering at one point is access to material wealth for African-Americans has in many ways turned, its, it's turned upside down and become one of the main things that keep us in a place where it's hard to participate in democracy. It's hard to participate and, and, and move around and understand what your government has in store for you. We're too busy. We're too busy working, meeting, Zooming, all of these things. And we're too busy to do it because capitalism creates our pace. Capitalism creates our worth because if we're not producing, we're not being productive, then are we productive citizens? Well, last time I checked, someone who is not working and out there trying to talk to people about the importance of voting or trying to figure out how to get um, people with felony records to be able to vote again and get driver's license and, and be able to get from underneath the system that we call um, the prison industrial complex. It's hard to get from under that. So all of these kinds of things 
school to prison pipeline is impossible without data. Um, the idea that we've had a very, very tragic and recent um, police involved incident and who perpetuated it, it's a wake up call, right? Because we're talking about systemic issues, right? Data, data, data. Data is monetized, data is translatable, but does data replace democracy? And that is kind of how I want to end it because I want to, you know, plead to you to not let data take control of your life to the point where you don't think for yourself, you only get what's given to you, and you don't go out and try to actively engage in what democracy looks like. Because I think Du Bois would, would, would also agree that without action, without movement, democracy becomes stale. And um, damn, that's really sad again. Um, sorry, um, <laughs> just not, I'm not ending on a good note. Um, but I will say that that shift of, of hard science is going to solve it. And then this person gets killed and then it brings up the reason why Sam Hose was so powerful, not only because it was so close to Du Bois at that time, but because a month later, his son dies unnecessarily. And he says in the, the passing of the firstborn, it was bittersweet because he did not yet have a chance for the veil to be put over him, for him to have to live in a way as a second-class citizen. He only knew joy. He only knew the love of his parents and his family and those who looked at him as the future. And that's, that's what I hope that at some point we can use, we can get away from depending on data, engaging with each other and helping our young people to form opinions of their own and to not take what they do based on what TikTok tells them. And I have teenagers, so that's why I'm ending on TikTok. Um, and so I'll open it up. I'm sorry, I, I think I talked way too long, but um, um, I open it up to questions and, and I'm sure there's corrections because I, I, I saw some Du Bois scholars in the, in the audience. Okay. <laughs> All right, Marcy, you wanna um, put it back together again? Okay, so Thank I Thank you, Whitney. See. Oh yeah, let me uh, let me take Whitney off the spotlight. Sure, <laughs> there we go. Okay, I'm gonna try to take questions. Um, you know, I don't know that little hand that you put up goes away, so you can just put your hand up, and I'll try to catch you. And if you have, I know a lot of you, but please make sure you put your names. If they're not on the thing, please put them in there if possible. Um, does anybody have a question they want to start or a comment? I do, okay. <laughs> if that's Marcy. okay. Whitney, I, I love this. Thank you so much. Um, I guess I just, I, I wanted to just say something about the, the issue you said about local knowledge and how important that is. Because I think what I'm feeling about local things going on in Amherst, let's say, is, is that even in the local realm, there's still misinformation. There's still two realities at least about issues and events that happen. It's really hard to even find any space in our society where we're clean of that possibility. Um, and definitely on the national level, we see that a lot, but not, not to be too uh, discouraging, but I, I feel like there's definitely that same sort of microcosm of the of bigger national picture. We see that in Amherst too. Um, and I, I don't know what to do about it really, but I wondered if you had any thoughts. Um. No, I don't have any solutions. <laughs> no, not solutions, but it's just interesting. Like, what what would Du Bois say? 
what would Du Bois <laughs> say? Du Bois, well, it depends on the day. I feel like um, I think that I think that Du Bois left at the invitation of uh, Kru, uh, Nkrumah um, to go to Ghana because he felt like democracy was just beginning. Um, I'm I'm kind of glad he didn't get to see you know what what happened in in Ghana um, initially, but I think that for him there was still the ability for people to begin again and. He wrote a piece specifically about why he doesn't vote for president, and and part of it was it's already been decided. Like who cares? Where and that's the part where he's not telling people not to vote, but he's telling people to vote with a conscience and to vote in places and do things. Like like I said locally, where you can you can engage with people, right? And I think that is, for me, that's the key. It's about and ironically, you know, post pandemic, it is about face to face. It is about being held accountable. Um, when people want your vote, they knock, they go door to door, right? And they give you flyers and they give you buttons and they want to put stuff in, you know, signs in your lawn. And then uh, are they still engaging you after election and, and they're elected? Um, and if not, then it's time for you to say hello. Uh, you know, you came to my house once. I haven't seen you since. Not that they should come, but this idea of civic engagement. Like, I feel like my children don't take civics in, in school anymore. You know, I mean, there's, you know, young, young people don't even know how to sign their names. Why? Because they don't have to, because they use keyboards, right? And that's, that's to me telling of data. That to me is telling of, artificial intelligence it's it's telling me you know there we need to be cognizant of the fact that i had to actively teach my children to shake someone's hand and look them in the eye right because even teaching at a university level it's very hard for my students to engage you know eye to eye um and then you know ironically um in my courses i actually there's a lot of laptops open. And as some of my colleagues say, I don't let that happen. They're shopping. And I'm like, you know what? That laptop open, and I, a student told me this, and it, it kind of blew my mind. That laptop open is security. That laptop open means that that student can be there and be present. I, I, I know it sounds crazy, but that, that the screen itself is security. And it's amazing that in my courses, as I'm teaching a class, it'll be something like, oh, I can't remember what that, and they will, they are on it and they contribute to the lecture. See, like there's a method to my madness, right? And if you're shopping, it's okay. You go, maybe that's your comfort too. But ironically, the people that I always think are not listening are the people that are listening the, the most intently. So I don't take, you know, visual or who you are for granted and, and assume that's what that is. But when a student told me I feel safer when my, my laptop is open, I really had to like think about that. Like, I, why? Because that's their lives. Especially after the pandemic, everything they got was from that screen. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's scary, but it's how do we engage that and still maintain our humanity and our ability to talk to each other and hold each other accountable? Big question okay auntie auntie ruth <laughs> hi i tell you i'm just so in awe whitney listening to you tonight knowing you for well before you were born but um i just wanted to kind of with at the risk of opening up a complete different can of worms we need to stay woke we need to make sure i love your comment Take it to the grassroots level. Do we know the people in our inner circle? Because they have tremendous decision-making power over things like taxes and where roads go and where schools get built and the things that impact our minute by minute lives. And then you go larger and larger until you get to the federal and the international level. But we need to stay woke. We need to pay attention and make it a part of our lives. Just like if we have meetings, if we have things, we put them on our agenda and we do them. We need to make sure that, that government 
And as you said, data and democracy, I love the combination. They need to be front and center in our lives. What did I do today to decode some data? What did I do today to ensure one crumb of, that, of democracy that I have the power to ensure? So that we don't just say, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm not voting. I'm not, you know, I'm not opening my door. That's not the answer. Why? Because just like your children, Whitney, and mine and my grands, we have a huge reason, our next generations, if nothing more than the future of all of us, we need to pay attention. And that's my comment. Thank you. And staying woke is saying a lot because um, my Aunt Ruth is in Florida. So that means a lot coming from Florida. <laughs> Thank you. I know. I wait, Can't I'm looking leave. outside my door now. <laughs> I was going to say, you better be careful. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's terrible. You were violating the woke, whatever. That man doesn't even know what that means. I, I'm just so clause. fascinated. Yes. I, I'm fascinated. This is a world that we live in now that people say things and they have no idea what they're talking about and they get away with it. And most people have Google. Why is it nobody goes and says, what? Is that what, what's, what's critical race? What critical race theory? What does that mean? Nobody ever says that to some of these people. They have no idea. We can't teach that in kindergarten through third grade. They don't teach it in kindergarten through 12th grade. What are you talking about? So again, we, we just have to, whatever. So questions from anyone or comments? Erica. Mm -hmm. I think it was really interesting what you just said, because um, the quote that I love the most is the ultimate evil is stupidity. And I think <laughs> that that kind of ties this whole thing together. Um, and I, in talking about stupidity, um, I want to come to a realization. I got my bachelor's degree in 2012. I was an adult student when I went back to school. And I got my bachelor's degree in sociology and political science. Uh -huh. Throughout, I traveled. I was an older student. I went to school. I had never once heard about the connection between sociology and W.E.B. Du Bois. I had read W.E.B. Du Bois in my African-American history classes. Mm -hmm. But it was never presented as um the founder of sociology, sociology. <laughs> and i'd love to hear more about it and i mean this is something that as for the last year and a half i actually it actually woke me up when i started going to the web du bois morning um events that were happening at the library and i said okay i got up and went to the reading a couple of times i said wait a minute what is this and then the visualizations and I think that, can you tell me how the visualizations tie in to the conversation that you were just have, that we were just having? Because I think that that might be part of this in a mm -hmm. sense. Um, and that's what you were talking about in a sense, but um, I'm also in the department of, of computer science. And there were people that did research talking about the data visualizations. Can you talk more about that? Because I really, um, talking about that ultimate, e the ultimate evil is stupidity. Um, what are the benefits of keeping someone like me, a black woman that's going to school stupid about my role in sociology, but I learned about Marx and I learned about all these other people that mm -hmm. did wonderful and fantastic things, but I didn't learn about the history that was right in front of me. Well, what well, first two things is I, I mentioned Alden Morris, and so you really got to read the Scholar Denied. It is, it 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 not only talks about Du Bois, but it talks about the Atlanta School of Sociology. It was by and and here's the thing: we don't have the names of the students that did these visualizations because I, Britt, and I are probably about ninety nine point eight percent sure that Du Bois did not draw any of those visualizations. He did not color anything in, none of that. However, we would love to know the students' names who, who contributed to the exhibit itself. Um, the second thing that, that I wanna say is that wonderfully, Alden Morris, who wrote The Scholar Denied, and it got a lot of pushback, is now the president of the American Sociological Association. So, <laughs> It's like, yay, you know what I mean? So like th there's there's change, there's change afoot. Um, and 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 who came for him? 
Chicago, of course. Um, but the data visualizations were, were really ahead of their time and they were very radical in the sense that they were in English and in French because it was in, it was in Paris. But also the visualizations created kind of visual pictures that were catchy that even if you couldn't really read, you might be able to see the years and see instead of just bar graphs, right? They were different shapes. And, and one in terms of income had the amount of money bags, which is ironic because now we call, if you have a lot of money, you get in your bag. So I think that, I don't know if Du Bois had anything to do with that, but um, <laughs> this idea of, of, of creating the visual information takes it out for, I think, took it out of the textbook, took it out of the um, inaccessible. It made it accessible to whom? The people, right? And so <clears throat> every single award that could be won was won by that exhibit. And that was even more insulting to like everybody, like what, what? Now I do wanna say it was, it was then um, shown one time in Rochester and then went back to the, oh God, where is it, where is it? I'm, I'm blocking them because I'm, I'm mad at them. Hold on, hold on. Um, oh gosh, not the Smithsonian. Um, it'll, it, it'll, Library of Congress. <laughs> Speaking oh, of Congress, that group. The Library of Congress would not give Du Bois back those infographics because it is the Library of Congress's property. And that is where they are. And that is where they remain. And when Britt and I published this book to world acclaim, we tried to get the Library of Congress. Thank mm -hmm. you, Donna. She showed yes, the book. <laughs> we tried to have a, a book signing opening at the Library of Congress. They were like, nope, we do not take those visualizations out. So then we called our friends at the National Museum of African-American History and Culture. We were like, look, we're going to have it here. It's like right, we're like down the street. They were like, nope, we will not release these, whatever. Then we tried the Smithsonian itself. No, nope, we will not release these. So I don't, and, and data visualizations and infographics are now used from computers across disciplines from political science to, you know, of course, sociology, anthropology, math, et cetera. But it is the taking it away from the basic graphs to uh, uh, something that's more legible, something that's more colorful and something that's more inviting, but still has the data within it. And I think that's, that is the kind of propaganda that I'm talking about. It is literally inviting the folks in Right, and then you look at these visualizations, and you're thinking, "Oh, wait, what does that say?" Like home ownership, business ownership, uh, land ownership. All of these things were based in rural Georgia, and then you're juxtaposing it against these huge visual images of African American young African American people, you know, a bunch of women sitting on the steps at Howard University, uh, uh, just coming from class. You know, the, this idea that, that we were, historically black colleges were extremely crowded at that moment because of the desire to get education and have education and to move forward and to figure out. And it wasn't just to show anybody anything, it was about to get education and to live whatever that US American dream was supposed to be at that moment. And I think that is accessibility to material, accessibility to wealth, accessibility to all kinds of things. Um, unfortunately, it translates into, I, for me, it, it, it's very hard to, to see kind of the demise of, of black farmers right now and, and, and how critical that is, right? It, it talking about climate change and all kinds of other topics, but I, I'm thinking specifically about like the erasure of black cowboys. And 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 I mean, I, I, I grew up with black cowboys and I grew up in the Bronx and there were black people on horses, right? All over the place and mm -hmm. not all over the place, but in certain places. But what I'm saying is there's this tradition that it, that was resonant and kind of way, it kind of 
was living within this idea of a nation within a nation. And it's not to say that it's about separate but equal because we know of the inequality, but it is about that, that what that historic, historical black college gave so many of us that, that are able to get out in the world and do some um, things uh, in places that we're not supposed to be. That's a good, that's a positive, isn't it? <laughs> I guess. But definitely read Eldon Morris's A Scholar Denied. Anybody else? Because I, I we have two screens, so I'm just trying to not skip anyone. If it, someone has a question or a comment, well, oh, is that someone raising their hand? Oh, well, I just thought I would let people know to look at the Gazette tomorrow. Uh, the Racial Justice Committee of the League of Women Voters has a an editorial that will be in tomorrow's. If you get online, Gazette, then you would you know it already. Um, because I got comments from people. That's why I was telling Jeff. Jeff Gold, wave, wait, wave, Jeff, <laughs> did most of the work. <laughs> and I my name is on it because I'm alphabetically B is before G. Um, and it it's it, it's a study in in um looking at this on a local level while she was speaking is called Uncomfortable Truths and Democracy in Amherst is the name of the editorial. So, you know, take a look at it. Um, our generous steering committee of the league thought it was good enough and they approved it without very much anything but, but saying, thank you, this is good. So let us know <laughs> how you think of it. Now, anybody else? Because. Um, Du Bois' birthday would, will be the 23rd of this month, and uh, there are various things coming up. Um, there's a talk on the 23rd, which is a Thursday. At yes, the so I just, I just want to say, if you, uh, our, our, um, our talk on the 23rd of February, um, it's a, there's a few people that are coming to the library itself, but it is um, going to be streamed online. So if you go to the W.E.B. Du Bois Center at UMass, you'll be able to see um, the link on how to access that. And, and our speaker is Chad Williams, who is out of, oh boy, this is bad. Um, when, when your friends are so famous that you don't know their bios, um, but um, he just released a, a new book about Du Bois. And so um, I guess that's the one thing about uh, Du Bois and working on him, it, it, it's the gift that keeps giving because mm -hmm. Apparently, there's never going to be enough enough books, and I just want to say I'm so excited and happy to see David Williams's name and his face here in the audience. Thank you so much for coming, sir. Did you hear her, Dave? <laughs> You're muted. No, he didn't hear. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think that's it. Um, <clears throat> so, Andrea, is it okay for me to give a, a couple other things? Um, I just wanna, you know, of course, thank Whitney. Thank you, Bazillion Times, for coming. You're awesome. You learned a lot tonight. Um, and I also just wanna say next month, March 14th, again on the 14th, uh, our program series, the Judy Brooks series, will continue with Pamela Young and Jennifer Moyston, who are coming from the, uh, the DEI department of, of mm -hmm. Amherst. Um, we wanna just get an update from them and hear how things are going. So we've had a couple of really more expansive talks from Sudicetti and Whitney, you know, more, more broad, and now we're kind of hunkering back into Amherst a little bit, but please come. Um, all of these events are available on the LWV Amherst website and, you know, the YouTube channel from our league. Uh, and please feel free to go and listen to any of them. I also want to do a little shout out for league members specifically because on March 9th at 7 p.m., the Amherst League is having a program planning meeting. And our racial justice committee is moving forward, trying to um, put a proposal together to have a statewide league study 
which is a whole process in itself, but a league study to um, have the league the, on the mass level, the state level, study reparations for African Americans. And our hope is to create a proposal in our local pr planning group at this March 9th meeting on the, at 7 p.m. and then take that and hopefully the state will approve it and we can look at this on the state level. It feels really important, no league in, on any level, local, state or federal has made any um, kind of a formal study about reparations. Mm -hmm. And without a study and the process of consensus meeting, et cetera, this is the process for how the league becomes advocates for different areas that we, we care about deeply. And it feels like it's, it's overdue for us to be discussing reparations at, as a, a topic for the league to then be able to advocate for it. So again, that's March 9th. And it's really just for league members. And if you're jazzed about that, you can join the league and then you can come <laughs> and be part of that, that whole conversation. Finally, um, I see Kathleen's hand, but I just wanna say one more thing, which is when you uh, close out of this, I hope it works, but you hopefully will get a survey up on your screen. And it's really helpful to us if you fill out the survey, it just takes a couple minutes. So thanks again, and I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea. Okay. I'm sorry, I do wanna say that I, it wasn't just David Williams, it's also Pamela Marsh Williams. And, and so I just wanna say thank you <laughs> to Williamses for coming. Hi. <laughs> uh, one comment? Sure. Yes. Um, Whitney, great seeing you. Good to hear you mention Wilberforce University. I served as an adjunct faculty at Wilberforce during my studies <laughs> at Ohio State. Yes. And you can see who's behind me. Yes, I can. <laughs> yes. Great, great, great. Thanks Wonderful. so much. <laughs> Thanks and continue the good work. Thank you. Okay, Kathleen. Yes, I just wanted to mention that there are um, several states that have commissions uh, for studying reparations, California. There's a bill put forth in Massachusetts by uh, Senator China Tyler mm -hmm. for such a commission. And I think there's one being appointed to the state of, of Massachusetts. So there are uh, reparations commissions in action and activities around reparations in, in many states throughout the country. Thank you for that, Kathleen. Just to be clear, my comment was about league, the league, Amherst, um, the, you know, the League of Women Voters, both on the local, state, and national levels, not other commissions or, or, or government commissions or any other organizations, but the League of Women Voters itself hasn't yet um, looked into this. Yeah, so that, we, just, that we, we think that that will, if we can get it now, you know, it, it's, it could be some resistance we have to see um, because everyone doesn't agree on reparations. In fact, I doubt if anybody agrees, but to, to have that as a focus, uh, at least one of the focuses, it, it draws a, a attention also to um to the the concept and people can begin to talk about it and and actually research it and figure out that there's no one solution etc so you know in fact um jeff and i are are uh co-facilitating a a, a a class on um the stolen beam which is a, written by the jca jewish uh community of namers uh group of people uh, that uses some of um, Jewish law and Talmud uh, uh, um, advice on how you what you do with something when something is already built, but you found out it was built on a stolen beam and it goes from there. And so there's a lot of um, things you know about that kind of thing that needs to be brought to the public because people just don't know. 
And it's amazing to me how people don't know in a place where information is just at your fingertips. And I guess they just don't always want to know. But <laughs> anyway, so anyway, anybody else before we uh, close down and ask you all to take the little survey? We're hoping it, it comes up when you go to close. Don't, don't leave too quickly, just one leave. And then when you go, look and see if it's there. And if it is, that'll be great. If not, sorry. <laughs> so whoever gets it, please fill it out. Okay. There are no more questions. Good night. And thank you all for attending.